Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I am a, a long-term friend of, of TAG and of all you TAGites, if that's what you are. And uh, I really enjoy this, uh, this process. It's fun and uh, it leads me to uh, a point where I can spend a little free time thinking about the future in a different way. Um, I noticed something. This has been a strange year, 2019. I imagine you all noticed that. And um, 2020 is going to be a weird year, too. And, and it, one way that, uh, one leading indicator, a pattern that would tell you that is uh, if you looked around, which I did last week, to uh, who else is making predictions? Who are the pundits out there? Like Bloomberg always does something, and Wall Street Journal has a couple of things. Every year there's a, you know, the top 10 whatever for 2020. Not this year. No one's doing it. It's like, what does that tell you? you know, so the, the, uh, the Bloomberg guy wrote a whole piece on uh, actually about, about a book that had been written about it's hard to predict. It's hard. You know, it's hard. So that was his thing. And then um, Wall Street Journal had a thing about, um, uh, it's the, the, all the trends are coming to an end. <laughs> like end of days or what? So um, that was hard. That's a hard thing. And um, we have a saying at SNS. Uh, you know, you've all heard of, of um, um, kind of black swans or whatever, you know, th unexpected events. And our saying is there are no black swans. They're just really bad predictors. So... Um, uh, I think people are paying proper attention right now. That's the main point I'm trying to make here. Now, um, I'd like to throw out a couple of easy predictions just to kind of get warmed up, and then we'll, we'll do the usual thing. We'll do some stuff on uh, economics, some stuff on tech, and then we'll, I'll just read the, the predictions for the coming year. Um, so the easy ones are there's going to be an election this year, and someone's going to win, and the, the other guys are going to lose. There's going to be a football game on Sunday, and a guy named Russell is going to turn and give the football to another guy named Marshawn. Okay, I'm done with that. Those were the easy ones. The theme for looking at 2020 for me this year is one I don't think anyone of you will disagree with. So the theme is divided we fight. Right? That's what we're doing right now, worldwide. It's not divided we, you know, it's divided we fight. And no matter what business you're in, no matter what country you're in, that's what you're doing right now. It doesn't even matter about what. It could be about race, it could be about gender, it could be about politics, it could be about money, inequality, it doesn't matter. We're fighting all the time, more and more. And I think it's a fair question to ask. Last year, you'll remember, we talked about the net and the effect of the net on our psychology and so I think it's a fair question to ask in terms of governing, governance. When we see the eruption of a lot of nationalism and these, we see the growth of authoritarianism and all this kind of stuff going on, it's worldwide, worldwide. Is it possible in the age of the internets to have democracy? Or are we driven inexorably toward authoritarianism and the control that they insist upon having over their own private China net or Russian net or whatever it's going to be next? Isn't there a connection socially, politically, between those two things? And, and that we have inadvertently made an experiment for ourselves about this question? I don't know the answer, but I'm seeing the result unfold. And it's worrying. It's a worrying thing. And what I worry about most is the division thing, that divided we fight, that, that it's not about what you care about or believe in or where you're from or what skin color you got or what party. Everybody is fighting. And it would be a fair question to ask all of you, what are you angry about right now? Because I guarantee you're all angry about something. And whatever it is, you know, over dinner or at work, or like you're angry about something. What, you know? And ask yourself, I think, it's a fair question, why? Why are you angry? 
You, know, you don't really need to be. And yet, you know, I think we each listen to the news, we watch the television set, we do the thing on the net, we come home at night, and we're pretty angry and a little depressed. It's, you know, the world's a horrible place, and things are bad, and, and those other guys are bad guys. And it's like, no, actually, things are going quite well in general. Making a lot of money, new innovations, things are happening. We don't actually need to be that angry or that depressed. And I would suggest, and I think this is going to be part of the story of this 2020 year, that it really isn't necessary. So we're seeing people now who are like backing off on using their phones so much and using the net so much, using the screen so much. And, um, that's all symptomatic, that blowback of what we're talking about right now. And it's something that society will have to learn if we're going to stop being as negative as we feel today. And I'll say it again, it's not that the world is necessarily negative. I do believe that the net is creating a more negative world. I do believe that. But it's us. We are the world. So we have a, a voluntary choice of what to do about that. And it's in, in that sense, it isn't the world, it's us. And I think we have, we have a, a lot of freedom here to simply back off a little bit and spend more time writing poetry or listening to music or your family or, you know, painting. Whatever gives you pleasure, take a walk in the forest. If you're in Bellingham, look at mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> but, but whatever it is, you know, there's a lot of pleasure to be had, and we should, as human beings, allow ourselves the freedom to feel good. All right, enough of that stuff. Um, next up, and related to this is, you may have noticed that we have a new idea now in town, the world, uh, government by protest. And this kind of goes back to Russia a little bit. If you go back to Ukraine and Georgia, uh, the Orange Movement, the Green Movement, at some point, before Tahrir Square, it became clear to, I think, people who were in power, that if you don't like the results of an election, just wait five days and have a protest. And you throw out the guys you didn't like, you get everybody upset, they all wear orange t-shirts or yellow vests or whatever they're gonna wear, and then you get the guy you want. And of course, the CIA, we're, we are not guilt free here, has been doing this for 30 or 40 years. We did it in Chile and other places. But it's now becoming regular. And you could almost ask, we're back to the question I was asking a minute ago is it possible to have a democracy without having that experience? Is it possible to have free speech? Is it possible to have access to the net for all of your citizens and not have that experience of overthrowing the government within about 20 minutes after people are upset? It's very easy to make people mad. We know that, and we know the Russians specialize in that. IRA, you know, the research, we have a person here who's an expert on that. Uh, you know, disinformation and so forth, but it's not hard. It's just not that hard to make people really, really upset, get them out in the streets, put on a, you know, a green sweater, and get rid of those guys. And so then you're left with no government, and then you have to get, I think, you look around the world right now, a very large number of countries are experiencing that. I have a short list here. Uh, Venezuela, France, Egypt, Ukraine, Georgia, Libya, Lebanon, and more. This is happening every morning. And so I would just, I'm putting it out to you on an intellectual basis, is this now how we run things? Is protest the obvious part of democracy that's more powerful than, than the democracy itself in elections? And if so, we're kind of screwed. We'll have to redefine democracy in terms of the net and anger and crowds and who can protest more rather than who voted for whom. Uh, another thing that I'd like to swing your direction and see what you think about is, and this is, as you know, we study China a lot. And the reason we study China a lot is because China is the largest effect on many things that are affecting all you guys in technology and all of us in the world. So it's not because we feel good or bad about China or the people of China who we like, but we are probably the world experts and we have that person here too, uh, on China's effect on the global economy and on IP theft and on therefore on technology and its path. So um, a lot of the things that are happening today and I think one reason why the pundits were unable to predict this year 
<coughs> goes back to the prediction that we shared with you three or four years ago. You may remember, those of you who've been here for a while, we said in January of 2015 that China, was, two things were happening. China was starting to reverse, it was contracting. They were stumbling, they were having serious internal terror, fear problems about their own economy contracting and they were gonna try to hide it and fix it. And that's been going on since 2015. And now what we're seeing is two things. The tariff, we don't call it trade wars, we call it tariff, the tariff wars. And if you read the Wall Street Journal last week, you would completely get it wrong, which is why I'm bringing this up. So the Wall Street Journal says things like, the trade wars are bringing down the global economy. No, that is not true. Bad dog, don't say that. So what's happening is, China is experiencing something rather terrifying. They are in contraction, and they are trying to hide it, but it's hard to hide. Uh, if all that were happening were that, most of the things that we would talk about for the rest of today would be true. So if you knew, and, and you did, because you were here in January of 2015, if you knew that China was backing up, and they were having a lot of problems internally, and they were trying to hide those problems and they were trying to make up for them and anybody who's a trading partner and so forth and so on would be feeling that, you'd go, oh, I, I understand the world today. I totally get the world. And then you could make predictions about whatever you're interested in. But you'd have to have that data point to do that. It is a very, very, it, probably the most important data point you could have in terms of trade, in terms of economy, in terms of global technology. So you guys have that, that's helpful. Now let's go back to the tariff war, not the trade war. It turns out, we believe, that the model that China uses is based on the theft of intellectual property. We were the first people to really publicize that in America, the world, I think. So um, I think now you probably all agree. It wasn't, it wasn't clear 10 years ago, but now it's clear. So if that's true, then you have to ask yourself, if, if we or someone like us doesn't stop China from doing that at their scale, now it's gonna be 1.4 billion people, what happens to the global economy? Well, it, it, nothing good, I'll tell you that. So if it's true that technology, and I'm speaking to the choir now, if it's true that technology drives every single part of the global economy, and IP, intellectual property, is its asset class, and China's whole idea, only one idea, how to get rich is to steal that, and sell it back to all of you at half price, oops, that's gonna be a bad day. So it's not a bad thing that we're having what's called a tariff war. It's good. Is it effective? Yes. Is that good news? That's terrific news. That, you couldn't have better news. We finally found a way to get China's attention after 30 years of argument and debate and speechifying. Tariffs actually work. They really got their tent, like within days, they got their tent. So will we stick with it? Don't know. Who's gonna get elected? Don't know. But we are really the leader in the world at trying to get this system to change its path from one of theft-based, subsidized selling on the global market to something better. And it worked with Japan. There's no reason it won't work with China, but it's harder with China. So instead of saying what the Wall Street Journal said, let's flip it. Instead of saying that it makes it sound like, like Trump's trade war is ruining the global economy. No, China's choice of model is ruining the global economy and Trump's tariff war is our only hope. And I'm not saying this because I'm a politician or I'm, you know, I don't care, but we spend a lot of time looking for patterns in how the global economy works. And we're here today to tell you this is how it works. So if you care about inventing, and if you think that inventing and creating IP drives the global economy, this is the result of that. So that's where we are. And I think it's important to see that cart and the horse in the right order. Uh, I'll lighten this up a little bit soon. But um, uh, also, what you also see are, and, and when we uh, at Invent IP talk, we, we say, you know, it feels a little bit like 1939. So if you imagine, how the corporations were acting in that year, right? We had IBM selling to Hitler. 
we had General Motors selling to hit. All the big corporations were selling to Germany, and they kept doing that, by the way, during the war. They just had shell companies doing it. So um, don't count on Apple. Don't count on Tim Cook to tell you the truth. Don't count on Boeing to tell you the truth. And I worry that just the David Cameron, just as with Neville Chamberlain, I just worry that um, we have all these short-termers who want to do quarter-by-quarter quarter earnings hits and get paid their bonuses and who are unwilling to face the truth and who are lying to us and trying to lobby for the guys who ultimately will destroy their company. And that's just not very intelligent long-term. So um, I would encourage those of you who are in management not to do that. We're going to see a split, uh, and the split is really coming from China. So you may have noticed that China announced uh, two weeks ago, they went from this made in 2025 thing where they're going to have 80% Chinese goods and so forth in tech. Uh, they started throwing out people who were making uh, personal computers and uh, foreign companies that make software and so on. So they're literally forcibly ejecting foreign products now on a three-year run. So three years from now, their goal is out. Now, that was always true, I think. But it wasn't obvious. It wasn't stated in an obvious way. Now it's, it's, on, it's public. You can read it in the New York Times. So uh, there is going to be a split technically between whatever China decides to do with standards and everybody else. And what will that mean for you is that there are going to be some choices here that no one ever had to make before. And we've had stuff like, you know, England's plugs are different from our plugs. And, but essentially, we're pretty good at uh, 3G, 4G, 5G. You know, we, we're pretty good at standards. Well, 5G, uh, -uh. The, the 5G area was where China made a, a stand. And they, they want to have their own 5G and have everybody else follow that. And we'll see how that works. I think they're going to lose that battle. Uh, but that's just the beginning of the fight. Suddenly, only chips made in China by China for China. So imagine chips. You put chips in computers, right? Well, which chips are you going to buy? The cheap ones? I guarantee they'll be cheap. Half price, one-tenth the price, one-fifth the price, free. There will be cheap chips available from MediaTek and from Chinese sources. Huawei's well, going to make chips. They're making them already. And they'll be sold on the global market. That's going to be a standard, just like Intel 88s were a standard. Well, which one are you going to buy? People in poor countries tend to buy cheap things. And it's hard even in a, in a wealthy country to make the argument to spend money. All these things are going to come up in terms of your own bomb, your own build, build of materials. How are you going to build that computer? How are you going to build that server? How, whatever you're going to do. Why did it double the price of thing for you to have half price? Your boss will ask you. So um, this is going to be a big fight. And the world hasn't had a fight like this before in the information age. So it'll be new for all of us. Nations will face the same the same choice. So there are going to be sides here now. And this is going to be difficult. You can watch the Southeast Asian countries trying to struggle to be friends with the U.S., friends with China. Friends with China. It's very hard for them right now, Indonesia, Japan. Uh, some countries are already owned. Cambodia is a fully owned division of China. There is no Cambodia. There's just China. And they're, they're naval ports. And the whole Belt and Road thing, this is not a secret. It's it starts as a commercial debt trap, ends up being a Chinese port. And the Navy goes there. So within a year or two after a deal, the Navy's going to go there. This is happening worldwide. So how will countries decide, do I do that port deal? Do I do that Belt and Road deal? It's free money. It's cheap money. And they, people will tend to want to do it. It's human nature. But soon enough, you're going to see, choose side, take a pick. Are you going to let the Chinese Navy you know, into your country or not? Yes or no? Are, you, are they going to have an operating port for a 99-year lease where you're not allowed on it yourself? They own that part of your country for 99 years, like in Australia. So people got caught. Australia got caught off guard. They had no idea what they were doing. Uh, now people are waking up, and it's going to be a really interesting contest of will and of interest to see both technically and geographically and militarily and strategically how these two sides work with each other. But I'll tell you one thing. It isn't going to be the way the propaganda comes out of the Chinese Communist Party. It's not going to be uh, that Xi Jinping is a green leader or that the Belt and Road Initiative is a way of helping poor people. That ain't it. So as it becomes clearer, uh, we think that there's going to be a new evolution of understanding China, which will help people make this decision. 
and we call it the Real China. It's the Real China Project. And, and here's the question, if you're, if you're a, uh, the head of HP or something, if you knew, and we're, I'm going back to 1939 again, if you knew that a country uh, was the most repressive country in the world, had a million and a half people in concentration camps against their will, uh, was, was illegally stealing from all of your competitors and from you, uh, was selling all that stuff at half price illegally on the open market, and on and on and on. If you knew that, you wouldn't deal with that country, right? You would. How would you explain it to your kids? How would you explain it to your colleagues? Why did you buy and sell with those guys? They've got a million and a half people in concentration camps. Well, I, was, I didn't pay attention to that part. So I think we're at that moment, just as we were in 39, where it's gonna to be too hard to play stupid. It's just gonna be inconvenient, I think, to continue to pretend we don't know what's going on. We all know, and then the question is, you have to make an ethical and business decision. You can decide to keep going, but at least you cannot deny what's happening. And that'll be hard. That's gonna be interesting. And what we're seeing now, this is already happening in 2019, is companies are moving out of China, not just because of tariffs. Tariffs are part of it, but also for these reasons. And they don't wanna have their IP stolen. That's probably the main reason. And, and so this is a shift in the world away from a country that was already in contraction in January of 2015. Well, what happens to them? That's interesting. That's a really interesting question. What, we, what I hope, what we hope is that it gets their attention enough. It puts the fear of God into, or the fear of failure, into the Communist Party enough so that they change their ways. And they do just what Japan did. They focus on the parts of things they're really good at, like manufacturing. They improve that, and they stop stealing everybody's IP. And if that's the result, we're all gonna be very, very lucky and be terrific. That will not happen in 2020. So um, this is the year of division, as I mentioned to begin with, and that's probably the most important part of it. I'm gonna say one more thing about um, um, the outside world in general, geo stuff, and that is Scott Morrison. Does everybody know who Scott Morrison is? Uh, okay, Australia. Uh, Scott Morrison is the prime minister. He is part of a party which is owned by the mining interests of Australia. Australia is a resource-based economy. Four-fifths or something of their GDP comes from that. So, um, and they have a political system where within 15 minutes, if those interests aren't happy, they get rid of the prime minister and they put in another one, which just happened to my friend before Scott showed up. So, um, Scott knows that he'll have 15 minutes before the phone rings if he says the two words global warming. He is not allowed to say global warming. If he says global warming, he's out. To watch him stand in front of the destruction of Australia and say how his hearts and prayers are, you know, going out to the, the dead firefighters, I would be extremely surprised if he lasts for three months uh, from now. So probably in 2020, Scott will be replaced by somebody else. That doesn't matter. That's good. What's more interesting is I don't see how Australia goes forward. I mean, if you ever wanted to have a revolution, just, just do this, right? Just have people burned out of their homes, standing on the beach with their children, removed by the Navy in the night, and have the prime minister, have the ruling guys from the mining thing saying, don't worry about that. It's a vacation. So uh, they, they, the people who run the mining companies, are not stupid people. And even though they have a vested interest in this, they're really not stupid. I think that they've got to be sitting in some room somewhere, having some pretty serious conversations about, we have to change how we've run this country. And that's gotta happen. I just think there's no way around that. They have to come out with an enlightened support package for the next guy when Scott gets hung by his toes in downtown Sydney. And, and that makes more sense for the country of Australia. Because they are the guys who are running it but they're not, they're not leading it. They need to be leaders, and they're not doing that. All right, and then uh, let's jump to uh, technology. And I've mentioned this schism. I wanna mention one thing about Huawei. People keep saying Huawei security, there's no back door. That isn't the point. I, I don't know why this is hard to understand. Huawei, first of all, a lot of lies about this company. Huawei is a direct 
offshoot of the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. That's who created Huawei. Huawei was created by stealing Cisco technology and shipping it with the Cisco name still on the manuals. That was the beginning of the company called Huawei. Huawei was financed by the PLA. Billions of dollars from the PLA in the early days went to build up Huawei. Huawei was nowhere, and suddenly they were a $3 billion company. How'd that happen? That was the PLA buying a lot of servers from, you know, routers from Huawei. So every, at every step, including the Ministry of State Security, bailing them out when they needed to be bailed out and putting in a woman who was a chairman who was from the MSS, which they don't like to talk about. So Huawei has a deep connection to MSS, to PLA, and that's their story. That's, we all have a story, that's their story. So you don't have to ask, is there a back door? Or you don't have to listen to them and say, we're not related to the state. They are the state. Huawei is the most important project China has. The CCP and Xi Jinping depend upon Huawei winning as a model because they are the champion. They are the exact dream that Xi Jinping has for how to make money in China. So if, if Huawei fails, very bad things happen for Xi Jinping, for China, for the Chinese model. It's an intolerable situation for them. They wouldn't let it happen. And think about the other way around. If we fail, you know, so if, if you know, Cisco failed, well, Nortel already failed. Right? So that was, in, in my mind, that was Canada's coolest, best, most important tech company. Huawei ate them for breakfast. Motorola failed. Huawei ate them for lunch. So we don't defend our guys the way they defend their guys. But they know that their future is on the line if that company doesn't become a world beater. And so it's, it's, it's much more than we think when we read the paper. Like, you know, whose router is better or what is the pricing on this deal? It's way beyond that. Uh, get ready for chip wars. I've mentioned this briefly. Um, here's my favorite funny story. Uh, everyone's been watching TV probably, you know, T-Mobile, 5G's coming. I like T-Mobile, by the way. It's a neat company. Did you notice during the football game that they were advertising, they had this, this commercial where there's this very tall tower in some unknown city, and then these beams shoot out from the tower, and then it's saying like, T-Mobile shoots out beams farther than anybody. The new 600 you know, megahertz beams that go forever by T-Mobile. That's like with the left hand, right? And then about a week ago, or two weeks ago, it's like, T-Mobile, the largest 5G company footprint in the world, or in the nation. If you know physics, right? You know physics. Uh, okay, 600 megahertz goes far because it's not 5G. It's the opposite of 5G. It's like the lowest possible frequency you could get your hands on. It's lower than what I used to have a Motorola box phone. And then 5G is way, way up here. And they don't have any of that spectrum at all. They don't own any. So. I don't know, it's a joke, it's kind of a joke. But what you're gonna see this year is a lot of frippery around 5G where everybody lies about what they've got. Whatever they're selling, I don't know, take two looks before you buy it because it's probably like T-Mobile and it probably isn't really 5G. And all these people are expecting to use this gigantic jump in bandwidth. Typically what happens for every one of these jumps from two to three to four to five is the carriers have a decision to make with the spectral efficiency of that bandwidth how to divide it up. Should I give it all to Evan or divide it up everyone in the room? And if they're all gonna pay me the same amount either way, I'm gonna divide it up with everybody in the room. So instead of Evan getting a gigabyte or whatever, he'll get one tenth or one twentieth of that and all of you guys will be suffering a little bit. But it'll be 20% better than before or 100%, but it won't be 10,000% better than before. And my, that's my guess is the, that whole 5G thing, uh, Years, years from now. So I'm just about done with this part and then we'll do the, the, uh, the predictions. So um, a lot of stuff going on, but, but, and I'm very biased about this thing, as you'll see in a minute. Um, I think that the true drivers now of money and, and in many ways of technology are gonna be uh, kind of healthcare, biotech, and computing together. Um, there's just so much to be done and there's so much that can be done now. So we know that the, the funds are already going into healthcare spending in the United States, we know that. But where's it gonna go? And instead of just saying, you know, in the past it could be Medicare fraud or something, well, 
a lot of it's going to go into R&D for health care and for cancer and for other diseases and how compute can help in, in major new ways that weren't available earlier. And because those new ways are now available, it's a big deal. It's, it's a new day in terms of, of the tech world. And although we've been talking about cancer for, you know, 30, 50, 100 years, and we've been talking about computers all that time, we're going to turn a corner in terms of the actual power of the compute systems that are going to be brought against those problems in a very productive way. And that's exciting. So I think there's going to be a lot of, of success there, a lot of discoveries there, a lot of, of uh, noise and competition, and, and also a lot of really happy people. So uh, I think at that point I should uh, let go of that stuff, and then let's do the predictions, and I think Paul and I are going to chat for uh, a few minutes. Uh, as you, if you've been here before, you know I read these, which I apologize for doing, because uh, as he mentioned, a year from now I'll be uh, hung by my own petard on uh, whether they came true. So uh, here they are. Number one, autonomous electric cars move from a technology platform story to one of the great global economic impact stories. While overall car sales remain down in the short term, as a direct result of China's contraction, the industry's current retooling will result in future years of new growth and market domination in dozens of technology markets. Number two, 2020, it's time to talk about the real China, as Xi's ambitions for China become clear. The idea that it's okay to trade off quarterly profit performance for partnering with the most dangerous and repressive country in the world becomes a non-starter for an increasing number of global business leaders. The process of disengagement from the real China has its practical start in 2020. Number three, privacy takes its proper place in e-commerce. Having awakened to Facebook's foibles and Zuckerberg's devious word evasions, people are now sensitized to being zucked with Facebook as exhibit A. Even more encouraging, while half its users just don't care, the others do. Not using Facebook becomes a thing. People invent excuses why they use it at all in niche form. While new laws are passed against its tactics worldwide, Facebook becomes the spiritual ghetto of the social network city. You can tell where my heart is on this. Uh, number four. The whole home network idea takes major hits, even as it grows. Some homes have 10 Echo Dots, cross-talking Siri, Alexa, and Hey Google appliances in every room, while other homes put their phones in the freezer. This home privacy invasion market becomes the physical battleground over world privacy rights. Number five, the year of cloud confusion. Is it the AI cloud, the healthcare cloud, Cloud providers find themselves desperate to differentiate their data centers through new acquisitions weekly, racing to bring on their own proprietary pattern recognition processors as they urgently chase more money than they can imagine through hallways they are just now designing. Number six, net division will continue to harm society worldwide, pitting big companies versus countries, people against people, and countries against each other. CRINK, which stands for China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. CRINK versus the rest of the world will destabilize the planet using the net. Number seven, Amazon emerges from the big tech scrum as the company that will just keep on growing forever, no matter what. Copycat Alibaba, eat your heart out. Number eight, the Boeing story becomes iconic not just for the firm's well-publicized safety lapses, but as an international takedown target. Who will the Chinese Communist Party target next? Cars, chips, and smartphones with terrific stakes at hand. What happens to China if Huawei loses? What happens to Germany with a declining Daimler or Volkswagen? Who will the new winners be, and what is it worth to their home countries to make it so? Boeing has a huge return in 2020. Number nine, the ride disruption business model capitulates 
with higher pricing, real differentiation, and corporate bodies everywhere. Electric scooters are headed for the dump, together with uh, rental bikes of every color, cars to go that didn't, zipped cars that got unzipped, and other flashy transport flotsam that disappears, either dies, get bought, or limped off the stage into the day-glow night. One of ten survives by charging enough to profit, but at horrible historic capital cost, certainly never to be reclaimed. Oh, and electric bikes do well. And number ten, major discoveries are made in cancer and computing together, as accuracy and scale of integration into safe and efficacious treatments dwarfs the past pace of advances. Life is complex and it requires complex mathematics to be its proper partner. That's it. And um, so, Paul, if you want to talk a little bit. And I want to mention one little thing about the Boeing comments that I made. I promised Paul I would. Uh, those of you who watched the whole Max uh, debacle unfold, if you were watching closely, you will have noticed something that had never happened before. China and their FAA, version of the FAA, was the first international regulator to take, to shut down those planes. Now we've been waiting for China with its C919 program for a decade to challenge Boeing. But even we didn't think that it would happen in this way. So imagine when our FAA said, we're not going to approve the MAX until every international agency approves it first. We'll be the last. When our guys said that, China must have sent them a bottle of champagne. So Boeing found itself in the middle of this, this fight that was started by China that wants to sell 737s. Now, the C919 is a 737. It's kind of a mix between the Airbus and the... But it, it is a 737. It's destined for the same market. It's already being sold into that market in South Asia. And so what better way to get a real leg up on Boeing than to not let them fly in Asia and then, of course, in the whole world? So um, I'm not saying that... I'm really glad Dennis got fired. He should have gotten fired. And I'm really glad that Boeing's going to do a redo on their whole safety thing, because they need to. But there is another part of the story. All right.